I think we're good to go. So how are you doing? Pretty good. I uh, am recovering from <laughs> my broken ribs and things like that. Yeah, well, see, I've been there with the ribs, not with the lung, but I, uh, at least I, I partly share your pain. Uh, <laughs> I have partly shared your pain literally, and I entirely share your pain metaphorically. Um, ah. um, anyway, I guess I'll, I'll introduce you. Um, so, uh, Welcome back to the Agora Cafe. I'm Roderick Wong, and today I'm happy to have with me uh, Bruce Benson. It's Bruce L. Benson, uh, I should specify, because there's also a famous Bruce D. Benson, and that is not our Bruce. Uh, Bruce Benson is a professor emeritus of, of economics at Florida State University, a research professor at Appalachian State University, He's the recipient of the Association of Private Enterprise Education's Adam Smith Award for 2006, the recipient of the Atlas Economic Research Foundation's 2000 Sir Anthony Fishy Inter Fisher International Award, not, not a Fishy Award, Anthony Fisher. I just realized it's very much like Anthony Fishes, which is a line from Anthony and Cleopatra. Um, he's a senior fellow at the Independent Institute. He's also served as visiting research fellow at the American Institute for Economic Research. Julian Simon Fellow at the Property and Environment Research Center in uh, beautiful Bozeman, Montana, close to my heart. And he's a distinguished visiting, he's been a distinguished, distinguished visiting scholar at Texas Tech's Free Market Institute a Fulbright Senior Specialist at the Czech Republic, a visiting professor at the Université de Paris, Panthéon Assas, and numerous other honors that I will uh, not attempt to enumerate. Uh, he's also written, in addition to over 200 articles and book chapters and so on, he's uh, published a number of books. The two that are his chief claim to fame in the free market anarchist, anarchist circles I run in uh, because we anarchists like to run in circles, are the enterprise of law, justice without the state, and to serve and protect privatization and community in criminal justice. But he's also the co-author with David Rasmussen of Economic Anatomy of a Drug War, Criminal Justice in the Commons, co-author with Melvin Greenhut of American Antitrust Law and Theory and Practice, co-editor of Property Rights, Eminent Domain, and Regulatory Takings Reexamined, co-editor with Paul Zimmerman of Handbook on the Economics of Crime, and co-editor with Terry Anderson and Tom Flanagan of Self-Determination, The Other Path for American, for Native Americans, which I, I hope we'll get back to. Because of the things I haven't read uh, by you, that's one of the ones I'm most interested in looking at. So, uh, you know, the way these things you go is I ask you to tell me a little bit about your background, your, where you grew up, your education, and then ultimately how you got interested in economics and in the economics of stateless law and uh, all this kind of thing. Um, I, that could be a, a long answer. I'll uh, try to keep it reasonable. Um, I grew up in Montana um, and uh, really just stumbled into uh, economics. I uh, started out in pre-law and, and uh, got uh, depressed, I guess would uh, be a good word uh, for uh, what I was finding out about it. Um, and so I, uh, I actually dropped out of school, got drafted, went into the military for a couple of years, went back to uh, school and just tried out uh, introductory courses for several different areas uh, and just economics just was an immediate appeal. Uh, the logic of it uh, was so powerful, at least for me at that time. Um, so I switched to economics as a major um, this was at the University of Montana. I went on and got a master's there as well, uh, uh, in part because I wanted to go for a PhD program, 
but I had uh, avoided math and, and statistics, uh, which PhD programs in economics expect you to have. Uh, so I did a master's and picked up some extra math and uh, statistics along the way. Um, well, then I went to, move. pardon? A well-calculated move. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I guess uh, it. Uh, I'm. Uh, I think today that uh, the mathematics of economics is is gone way overboard, and we're we've forgotten what economics should really be about. But uh, at that I'm time, quite among like, most of the economists I know, although of course, yeah, most of the economists I know are like Austrian or Austrian leaning, so it's kind of a yeah. Sad. There's uh, yeah. Uh, there, uh, but the mainstream uh, in economics is still highly technical, mathematical. Um, in fact, I've got my, my T-shirt. I don't know, you can't see it, but uh, it uh, shows a, a, uh, an individual writing on the blackboard, uh, a series of equations, and then he writes, uh, and then a miracle happens. I know that a cartoon that's a yeah <laughs> and then it goes on from there that's a co my comment on my uh chosen discipline um the uh, uh after texas a and m uh, uh where i mean in terms of my sort of free market or libertarian leanings they were uh in sort of developing i guess when i was younger uh, as a uh, uh, an aversion to authority. <laughs> I, I didn't like people telling me what to do. Um, and uh, probably my father was the main one at that time. But uh, then when I went in the army, um, that aversion uh, broadened mm -hmm. to uh, uh, include many other people and uh, institutions. Um, and uh, so uh, that... Uh, was there in my background when I went to Texas A&M. Um, it was a, a very much a free market uh, uh, institution at that time. Um, and I was fortunate to have uh, a number of fellow students who were very much in the libertarian camp, uh, free market economists. Uh, and uh, so the people I interacted with uh, sort of led me into that literature. Um, I, um, my first position was at uh, Penn State. Uh, I uh, actually was uh, promoted the last year I was there, but I got an offer from Montana State, so I got a chance to go home. Um, and I took it, uh, it's probably a mistake. Uh, the Montana had no budget to pay faculty with or anything like that. And I had some really productive years and no raises. And, and so after three years, I went on the market, uh, just hoping to get Montana State to raise my wage. But uh, that didn't work uh, as well as I'd hoped. And so I ended up at Florida State, uh, where, uh, again, I thought I'd be there three, four years and go someplace else. I ended up being there for 30 years. Um, and uh, so that's sort of the overview of my academic career in terms of uh, my development, uh, developed interest in free market policing, free market courts, uh, uh, justice without the state. Um, that uh, I can probably attribute to David Thoreau uh, at the Independent Institute um, or Murray Rothbard, uh, one or the other. Uh, David was putting together a, an edited volume on uh, sort of free uh, or no, edited volume on gun control. And he wanted a sort of libertarian perspective 
And <clears throat> so he called uh, Murray and asked if he knew any libertarians or, uh, who were working on crime and, and those sorts of issues. And Murray gave him my name. David called, asked if I wanted to contribute to the volume. And back then he offered me $1,000. So that was enough to convince me uh, that it was worthwhile. Um, it turned out, uh, I mean, my argument essentially was that uh, if you look at the data where people are arguing guns are a cause of increased violent crime, uh, there is a, a, a correlation, but my argument was, uh, but at least part of that correlation is due to uh, causation in the other direction. Essentially, uh, violent crime is causing people to buy guns for protection. And I backed that up with uh, a bunch of evidence about private sector activity in uh, law enforcement, law uh, uh, crime prevention, those sorts of things. Um, and I found so much material that um, at one point I called David and said, I can shorten this to be a paper in your, your volume, or I could write a book. And uh, he said, well, I'll do both. And so I ended up uh, from that, the uh, enterprise of law developed. Um, and as I worked on the enterprise of law, I became more and more convinced uh, that the state is not required uh, for criminal justice uh, or for law in general, that the private sector uh, can do it. They have done it historically. Um, they're doing it today in, in substantial, uh, to a substantial degree, um, even though we generally don't know it because we don't, all we hear about is the public uh, sector stuff. So, um, that, uh, that got me into uh, the sort of libertarian anarcho-capitalist kind of uh, group of scholars that uh, uh, have been my, uh, <laughs> the people I correspond with, the people I uh, read and that sort of thing uh, now. Um, I uh, <clears throat> just close out. I, retired from Florida State uh, in 2015. Um, and uh, we've uh, moved up to uh, the mountains in North Carolina uh, to be closer to our kids and grandkids. And uh, uh, I'm still doing some work, but the, uh, the incentives are a lot weaker. I'm not trying to get raises or anything like that anymore. And so um, I keep active, but uh, not as active as I used to be. So a lot of what you do is sort of at the intersection of economics and law and history. Um, uh, so, you know, you'd had some background in law. You mentioned you had a, you, know, you were pursuing a free law uh, degree. Uh, how did, how did you get interested in pursuing the historical uh, angle? Uh, because a lot of Although it's sort of, you know, it's maybe more common for a lot of uh, sort of libertarian economists now, people like Peter Leeson, you know, delving into the, you know, the misty past. But, um, well, I guess some people were doing it uh, earlier too, people like, you know, Joseph Peden looking at Celtic law and so forth. But you know, how, like, how did you discover the, um, you know, the Kapaluku, if that's the right pronunciation of New Guinea and all these, all these folks? Um. But part of it uh, was uh, Thoreau sent the enterprise of law to a, a number, a large number of potent, uh, root reviewers. Um, and uh, they were very helpful uh, in directing me towards uh, stateless law uh, information in anthropology primarily. Uh, and, uh, and of course, I, I read Murray's 
uh, Murray Rothbard's work, and he does some history there. Uh, I read David Friedman's uh, material on Iceland, which is uh, a fascinating uh, example uh, that deserves much more attention than it's gotten. I think that was probably my the first the first thing I read of that of that kind. Yeah, it, it he he writes very well, of course, uh, and uh, he makes uh, very logical, powerful arguments there. Um, so, and I read his book, uh, The Machinery of Freedom, um, and so I uh, saw that you know so much of the work on private law at that time was sort of ad hoc theory, uh, no. Uh, real evidence that it might work just theory saying yeah this this looks like it could work um, yeah, stuff like the, like the Tana hills and the perkinses yeah. and so on yeah that's right and uh, and so uh murray and and david uh, and a few others uh Pedden, uh or however you say his name yeah i don't know uh, yeah we're looking at historical material and showing that in fact what uh, the way I envisioned a private arrangement in law actually has existed, uh, at least in part and in, in cases uh, entirely uh, for a community. Um, so I started reading the anthropology stuff. I started reading, especially history of the common law. Uh, and, you know, you get back into uh, pre-common law, Anglo-Saxon law, um, it was uh, very uh, largely stateless. Um, tribal law uh, has been primarily stateless throughout the world. Uh, you look at uh, anthropology. Uh, one thing I, I have done is just read a lot of different uh, descriptions of stateless systems and uh, noticed or looked for the uh, consistencies across those systems. Uh, the same sorts of institutions and arrangements arise in New Guinea as arise in the Comanche in, in the, the plains of North America. Um, and uh, and uh, Similarly, the, the what's called the law merchant, the mid um, of the medieval period, um, was a system essentially of private law arrangements for merchants trading uh, throughout Europe. Um, and again, institutions all look very similar. Uh, they uh, uh, evolve similarly. The rules tend to be similar across these communities. Uh, so it's uh, I, in recognizing those uh, consistencies uh, in these kinds of systems uh, that inspired me uh, to do some uh, writing, trying to make that point. Um, and uh, then of course, you, you write things in our disciplines for academic journals and the, the journal article has to be so, so short that people say, well, what about this and what about that? And, and uh, leads you to write more uh, and uh, write books uh, that uh, uh, help expand on those ideas. Um, and I sort of actually, uh, in terms of my um, academic career, I started out as a mathematical price theorist uh, out of Texas A&M. Um, and I published uh, a lot of stuff for about uh, five or six years in that area. But I was also, uh, I had Randy Holcomb as an instructor at Texas A&M, who's one of uh, our friends and, and leading uh, public choice economist. Um, and so I was also interested in public choice issues that started writing in public choice. Um, then David Thoreau got me into uh, private law. 
sort of the, the theoretical mathematical stuff fell to the wayside uh, and uh, my public choice and, and uh, private law stuff rose to the top and, and, uh, and it, my theory papers got in the AER, my anarchy papers don't get in the AER, American Economic Review, uh, <laughs> but I've placed uh, those papers in some very good journals along the way and, and so it's caught some attention. Um, uh, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Ed Stringham, who you know, uh, uh, has said that in his mind, my, the enterprise of law sort of legitimized the uh, study of private law because it was full of examples of how these, uh, it, it offered sort of theoretical explanations, but then with examples to back them up. Uh, and that uh, uh, led a lot of other people uh, to move in that direction. Um, so if I've had any impact, that might be the one uh, that has been useful that uh, uh, people like uh, Stringham and Powell and Leeson and those guys coming out of George Mason uh, are, uh, were influenced by uh, my writings at least. And so was I, though I'm not in the in economics or in history, but it, that certainly book certainly was a impact, had an impact on me back in the uh, you know, 90s or whenever I, uh, I read it. So the two uh, objections one often hears, uh, one is that uh, this kind of private law system only works for relatively small and culturally homogeneous communities. Well, I don't know whether law merchant would quite count as that, but, um, but anyway, that's an objection. But often, you know, so a lot of examples like the Comanche and the Kapalak and mm -hmm. the Iceland and so forth. The other objection is, you know, basically, well, if these systems are so good, then why did they get outcompeted by large centralized states? Do you have any thoughts on either of those? Oh, objects? many. <laughs> <laughs> I thought uh, you might have one or two. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, the first one is small community uh, argument is, uh, appears to be very powerful um, when you- like That was Thomas Jefferson's at, argument. Thomas Jefferson yeah. had a letter to Madison in which he said, you know, sometimes I think that having no government at all would be the best system. He talks about the three possibilities, like so basically, uh, you know, rule by one person or a few, democracy, and uh, and having no government at all. And he says, sometimes I think the third one would actually be the best. But uh, uh, and a lot of you know, a lot of Native American tribes. Well, he doesn't say Native American, but anyway, a lot of our Indians seem to have that system. But he thinks that only he says, oh, I think I think it would only work for a small community. So even he was. Yeah, uh, and, and, and part of that is that people who have looked at those kinds of communities look at, typically pick a community and they look at it and it looks like, uh, you know, it's, it's close knit community, all their rules work internally uh, pretty well, their institutions, that sort of thing, but they fail to recognize uh, that there's interactions between these communities or me members of these communities. And, and People what, think uh, American Indian tribes are spending all the time, their only interactions were like warfare. Yeah. Uh, not um, yeah, I am actually working on, on a paper right now about uh, uh, warfare on the Great Plains uh, among the tribes there. And, and it turns out that, yeah, there was a lot of warfare, but there was a lot of cooperation as well. Um, it would also apply to like late medieval and early Renaissance Europe. Yeah. Time of the law merchant. Exactly. There was uh, a lot it, of warfare. There was a lot of commerce and trade. Yeah. Um, so you get uh, among the Native Americans, for instance, you get commerce and trade. Um, there, uh, when horses were introduced into New Mexico in the uh, 1600s, I think it was, um, they uh, quickly moved 
opened up the west side of the Rockies through a trade network of, uh, uh, of the Utes and, and uh, Shoshone and, and these various tribes who all had the same uh, language uh, or very similar language. And so they could communicate and they traded and um, the, they quickly moved up uh, the west side of the Rockies and, and uh, most significant probably invasions of the plains then came from the northwest uh, into the plains uh, as people got horses and, and became uh, much more adept at hunting buffalo and so, so on. So you have these trade networks. Um, if there's no law, if there's no rules, uh, how does that work? Well, um, according to game theorists, it wouldn't. It would be a, uh, uh, there wouldn't be credible promises and so people would be cheating and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but in fact, these people develop relationships across communities. And, and so traders, for instance, um, are developing a different set of rules dealing with their activities. Uh, they're not dealing with all that stuff that local community is, the, the violence or the, that sort of thing. They're dealing with trade and, and maybe some other uh, inner community activities. And so, so you get- plains. Uh, what's that? A law merchant of the plains. Yeah, <laughs> and and so you get uh, uh, rules and institutions that work across communities in relatively narrow areas of, of uh, activity, um, and over time you build a hierarchy of uh, these communities um, linking each other uh, in various ways. Uh, so the, uh, the Anglo-Saxons, uh, they had, uh, their local institutions in the, the hundreds, they called them. Um, uh, but below that there were, uh, there was another set of local institutions, even smaller communities, um, the hundreds, but then, uh, the hundred court, uh, handled most stuff, but there was also typically a shire court of some sort that would handle relationships between people in different hundreds. Uh, and so you get a pyramid uh, or a, a hierarchy of institutions um, that link all these small communities in various ways, in ways that matter. Uh, if, it, if it's not something they're doing, they don't have law about it. But if uh, if they're trading or uh, cooperating in uh, warfare against a common enemy or doing various things like that, they're going to have uh, institutions and, and rules to deal with that. Um, that, that. That hierarchy is very different than the one we're familiar with within the government, of course. Uh, it's not an appellate system. Uh, you don't appeal from the local community to the next court up because the next court up doesn't even deal with whatever was going on in the local mm -hmm. community. Um, the, the local community deals with it, its own issues, may have very different laws than other communities uh, that they're networked with through that next higher tier of uh, activity. Um, so, uh, I think uh, I think that argument about uh, the uh, requirement for a close knit community, uh, in a way, is right, but it's not that it doesn't follow that those close knit communities are isolated. Uh, sort of net, next tier up close net communities can form uh, and do uh, where uh, now you've got interaction between different groups um, and uh, those interactions can expand in, in many ways as, as cultures advance and so on. Um, so, uh, I mean, if we look at law today, 
we've got local governments creating law and we've got county governments creating law and we've got state governments creating law and federal government creating law. Um, the uh, common law in the United States, there's essentially uh, 50 common law systems. Um, each state has its own common law. Um, so uh, this idea of uh, a sort of unified, centralized monopoly of law being required to have uh, widespread uh, cooperative interaction simply is, is not valid. Uh, with even careful look, not even a very careful look, frankly, at uh, actual illegal arrangements. Of course, also we have cooperation across borders where you know, there, exactly. There may be yeah. some, you know, treaties and things, uh, but they, um, but you know, they're not really so unified that they count as part of a single centralized legal system. Yeah. But um, you know, you, you know, go to Canada and you know, buying things there is very much like buying things here, except that they use different yeah different money. Uh, and that, you know, the idea that you need a centralized monopoly of law, uh, even if you make that argument, how big should it be? Uh, I mean, you've got uh, uh, Iceland with, what, 120, uh, 250,000 residents is a country, and you've got China with billions. Um, what's the optimal size for a legal system? Uh, it depends on whether it's an authoritarian system, uh, probably, or a, uh, a more uh, uh, based more on uh, individuals and their, their interactions and views. Um, so uh, I, uh, I guess part of it, that argument also probably goes back to Nosek because he, his model essentially was uh, uh, independent communities spread over space, uh, kind of bumping up against each other, but there was never any cooperation between them. And, and uh, uh, so it, uh, the, the earliest model of that kind of multi-system law, uh, he concluded was not going to work uh, because one ultimately takes over the other or something like that. Yeah, I mean, not that either they either they have found conflicts, in which case either one of them conquers the other and you get a state, or they're equally matched and so they divide the territory between them and you get two territorial states. Or if they cooperate through arbitration and so forth, they ultimately become a single unified legal system. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but... Uh, you know, but in yeah, you know, with, you know, in the um, like the Anglo-Saxon system you were talking about, the um, unified legal system wasn't even, you know, wasn't even authorized to deal with the particular disputes among people yeah. within those communities. It was totally, it was entirely about the disputes among the, the communities. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, today, uh, if you look at international trade. Uh, Uh, how widespread arbitration is in international trade is actually not easy to determine. And I don't know if anybody could, because a lot of arbitration is within trade associations and it's uh, uh, secretive. They don't uh, want outsiders knowing what's going on. Um, but uh, somewhere estimates suggest somewhere 90 to 95 percent of the contracts written in international commerce have arbitration clauses and uh, they're not all going to the same arbitration tribunal there's hundreds of arbitration tribunals um, the uh, typically with arbitration you can even specify the law that you want to apply um, and uh, so you don't have to be in the United States to apply US law if that's what you want to do. Uh, you write an arbitration contract and, and specify somebody else's law. Um, so uh, 
the idea that uh, systems uh, are isolated, in, independent at least, um, simply uh, isn't uh, empirically valid, I would say. Uh, what was your second point? <laughs> if, if this private law systems are so great, how, how do they all get outcompeted by big centralized states? Uh, well, that's uh, uh, my uh, argument there is that uh, what we think of as law uh, can, uh, at least what most people think of as law, there's certainly debates about what we mean by law uh, still going on, but uh, uh, law can be used for two functions. Uh, one is to facilitate cooperation uh, by enforcing property rights and, and encouraging people to live up to their promises in contracts and all that sort of stuff. And the other is that law can be used to transfer wealth. Uh, if somebody is powerful enough to uh, create a, a rule that says, well, um, consider, uh, go back to England, Anglo-Saxons, uh, some of the earliest uh, codifications of Anglo-Saxon law um, were simply codifications of local custom. Uh, the, the king wasn't making up new rules about uh, contracts or, or property rights and things like that. He was just having his scribes write down uh, what they observed out there. But in addition to that, there's always some uh, more stuff uh, about who got the money. Uh, and so if there was a trial, uh, historically, they would it probably be local uh, or it would be a pri uh, essentially private. It'd be a local uh, hundred uh, court or a shire court or something like that. But then the king started sending out his uh, his judges and uh, claiming jurisdiction over more and more stuff. And then he could charge fees. Uh, and then uh, instead of uh, uh, judgments based on damage awards or, or restitution or whatever you want to call it. Uh, they turn these start turning these laws into crimes. So they're crimes against the state. The state gets to uh, collect fines and confiscate property and all those sorts of things. And, and so uh, a powerful entity like the king, um, if he left the locals alone, they'd handle their law just fine uh, if uh, he decides that that might be a good source of revenue if he gets involved in those local disputes and things like that uh, he moves in um, and so um, in a way uh, I mentioned Randy Holcomb before he argues that uh, well private law might work in theory in practice, it's impossible because there are always going to be a state. Uh, and once you've got a state, they're going to start uh, uh, imposing new rules about distribution and that sort of thing. Um, he might be right. Um, I, on the other hand, uh, there are many examples where the state has historically tried to impose their rules and, and failed. Um, so, uh, you know, we have a, a vast international market in illicit drugs. Uh, they don't operate that market without uh, some sort of uh, rules and sanctions and things like that. Uh, it's kind of an underground law merchant, probably. Um, but, uh, and, and certainly the state has been trying to uh, suppress those uh, underground markets, uh, the trade that occurs, the, the methods they use for resolving disputes and all that sort of thing. Uh, of course, uh, violence is always a method for resolving disputes. And, and when uh, the uh, state prevents people from using something peaceful 
it usually they end up violence is is the solution um yeah like um producers of of alcohol don't shoot at each other uh, don't shoot at their competitors anymore but for some reason they did during the 1920s and it's a mystery <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh it, it uh it, of course they were also uh, you had uh were paying off the police and, and for support and all these other things that uh, the state uh, provided them with um, by uh, making something illegal you create the opportunity for an entrepreneur to move in and, and supply what people want uh, and it all you've driven the price up and you've also made it so that uh, people who aren't too risk averse are the ones who are going to go into it and yeah. people who are yeah. sort of comfortable with levels of risk and violence yeah, and people who have uh, low opportunity costs. They don't have an education or um, they don't have uh, particular marketable skills, but uh, they can uh, sell drugs or transport drugs or, or uh, create and make uh, drugs or something like that. Uh, and, and so you create uh, opportunities for people who otherwise may not have very attractive opportunities. Um, so uh, anyway, the uh, uh, in uh, when uh, I, I mentioned before that in England, when it was actually under the early Normans, they started essentially creating crime, turning uh, what had been tort uh, into crime, uh, where Prior to that, the issue was always uh, if you harm somebody intentionally or the otherwise, uh, you you owe them restitution, uh, compensation. Uh, but the kings uh, turned those kinds of activities or those kinds of issues into crimes increasingly. Um, you know, if I you know if I attack you, the primary victim turns out to be not you, but this guy yeah. on the throne somehow that I've injured. Yeah, and so the kings uh, sort of diverted all of those uh, restitution, pay not all of them, but many of those restitution payments into fines and confiscations for the king. Uh, that didn't go over very well. Um, I mean, uh, it, it took uh, probably at least a hundred years uh, uh, before people uh, sort of gave up resistance, uh, many people, uh, and just sort of fell into lockstep. But uh, the, the resistance to that idea continued for a long time. Uh, people simply went to their own dispute resolution processes and, and paid restitution uh, or uh, collected restitution and that sort of thing. So um, it's... Uh, uh, we see lots of authoritarian kinds of legal institutions, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're very effective uh, at doing what they uh, are supposed to do theoretically or doing what they're uh, intended to do, which is usually to take wealth uh, and give it to somebody else like themselves. Um, so uh, I, I think, um, much of legislation, probably most of legislation, is about transfers, uh, not about the things that law, sh in my mind, should be about, about uh, uh, encouraging cooperation and, and that sort of thing. I've seen uh, it argued. In fact, I think, I think David Friedman gives this argument with, with respect to Iceland, but I've heard people you know, give it more broadly that the um, that one factor that may be going on was cultural that there was a kind of uh, cultural ideology about kingship that go you know, drawing partly on the Bible and partly on ancient Greek and Roman sources the idea of the king as like the supreme source of order in society which didn't describe medieval society 
at all. The Kings are you know, were fairly weak and didn't didn't have that yeah. much control over most areas of life. But there was this inherited ideology, the sort of pastoral model, I think Foucault calls it, of the um, you know, the king as the shepherd who is guiding the mm -hmm. flock of sheep and so forth. And you know, as uh, as Herbert Spencer said, you know, we we passed from the um, you know from the uh, the superstition of the divine right of, of kings to the divine right of parliament. So nowadays there's a kind of uh, uh, similar idea about democratic institutions as having yeah. the, this glow of authority and legitimacy uh, to them. Uh, and that, um, uh, you know, even someone like, you know, like Thomas Paine who could write so, uh, you know, so perspicuously about uh, how most order in society is the result of, um, uh, of voluntary social order, a combination of self-addressed and, and moral sentiment um uh and and it's in the heart the state's necessary for hardly anything and the kings are all a bunch of of crooks and yeah. so forth but he had this you know he 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 didn't you know he thought that the democracy was going to great in fact he didn't even think he needed checks and balances he said why do the people need to check and balance themselves it doesn't make sense um yeah uh and you know so i think that you know that might be a factor in both cases so for when this this inherited ideology of kingship that didn't really match the facts on the ground. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, we have an inherited ideology of democracy with this idea that the people are doing the governing, even though most of the people have no idea what's going on and don't have time to educate yeah. themselves. And the special interests are the ones who are, uh, you know, who have the time and the money and the energy to direct the legislation in the direction. So, it, although a, a genuine pure democracy would would not be that great anyway, we don't, you know. We're no danger of having that, <laughs> uh, but you know, there's, you know, sort of cultural traditions can create in a kind of illusion that can lend legitimacy to uh, institutions that act in the name of that. Yeah, I, I, the uh, people uh, we think, or most people think, well, our constitution created a democracy, and it's lasted couple hundred years done pretty well but the constitution didn't create the kind of democracy they're envisioning i think now today it created a republican system with checks and balances between different levels of government and different branches of government and uh, it was it worked uh, not because of the the democracy so much as because of the uh, limitations that these checks and balances put on government. Um, of course, uh, other places have tried to do that too, and it doesn't work because the government's too powerful to start with or something like that. We sort of fell into an opportunity, I guess, by uh, revolting against the, the government that was in power and, and starting fresh or reasonably fresh um, and uh, but today talk to people in the political science department or in the uh, public administration or something like that and and you talk about uh, some sort of uh, institution that might limit uh, the power of the experts that they have uh, think should be doing things um, they think well that's not very democratic well uh, obviously if you're going to have pure democracy and nothing else it's going to be a disaster <laughs> i think and of course when people say well the united states has lasted such and such amount of of time so it must be a good system you can find lots of systems historically of various flavors that lasted a long time. I mean, the Icelandic system lasted longer than than ours has yet. Um, the Roman Empire, particularly, yeah. different system lasted longer. Um, Democratic Athens lasted about uh, about as long, maybe a little bit less long than we have. They, um, you know, they had a catastrophic break, break breakdown halfway through, but then of course, so did we. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. A uh, hundred years after the founding, there was a, a slight failure of the system. Um, uh, so, you know, just 
but anyway, just longevity, you know, if, if we're going to go by longevity, then, uh, you know, the Egyptian pharaohs would be the best system. Not that that was completely uniform over time, but still it was, you know, it, uh, you know, in something of a broadly similar system lasted for way longer than, you know, I think I remember recently reading that the, um, the time between the, um, between the building of the pyramids and Cleopatra's reign is longer than from Cleopatra's reign to today. Um, so to give us a little bit of perspective. I didn't realize that. Yeah, I think yeah. I, that, I didn't check it, uh, up on it, so you know, uh, I wouldn't bet my life on it because that would be a, a dumb way to die. But uh, but you know, that certainly is possible because the mm. you know the G Egyptian system goes back. Uh, you know, thousands of years, and you know, Cleopatra is only a little bit more than you know than two thousand years ago, um, since she was obviously a, uh, around at the final days of the Roman Empire. Um, now, I mentioned that uh, you know, the enterprise of law to serve and protect are the two books of yours that are sort of most well known among pre-market anarchists. But I think the enterprise of law is quite a bit better well known. Uh, I know a lot of people have read that, but haven't read To Serve and Protect. So you, yeah. you want to say a little bit about what's going on in To Serve and Protect. Um, well, the enterprise of law started out, I mean, or evolved into a huge amount of material, um, way more than I could put in a book. In fact, the first manuscript I sent uh, to Thoreau and he sent on to reviewers, uh, the response was cut it in half. Uh, and I'd already cut out tremendous amounts of material. So uh, I I wanted to do more uh, than what I did in the enterprise of law. Uh, and there were uh, two or three different areas that I really wanted to flesh out. One was crime and criminal law. Uh, the, uh, I mean, I, in the enterprise of law, I talk about civil law or common law, whatever you want to call it, uh, property contract tort, those sorts of things, uh, uh, and crime. And, and so they're all sort of a mishmash there. Uh, but I wanted to focus on crime or, or so-called crime in the criminal justice system. Um, <clears throat> and make the point, uh, first of all, that the criminal justice system as we envision it already is so dependent on the private sector that it wouldn't function without uh, the private sector. Uh, I mean, if, if witnesses and victims didn't report crimes, uh, there wouldn't be much for the police to do except create crimes like drug use that they could go out and chase people. Uh, or observe people themselves. Um, and uh, so, and then at, so I went through what we think of as the criminal justice system, uh, emphasizing that it is a system that what you do at one level affects the other levels, uh, like police decide they're gonna arrest a lot more drug offenders, a lot more drug offenders end up in the prisons uh, and uh, you get overcrowding, that sort of thing. So anyway, uh, uh, I did a sort of public choice kind of description of uh, the criminal justice system, um, trying to emphasize government failure uh, in that area um, rather than market failure. Uh, and then I uh, have material on private responses to that government failure, like private security, uh, private arbitration. Uh, well, no, that's, I guess I did mention that a little bit, but I, uh, focusing on crime, uh, you don't ar arbitrate many crimes. Um, the, but alternatives to public courts, which do exist in the, criminal justice process. Um, and 
I looked at the incentives created by a restitution system as opposed to a, um, uh, a punishment system. Um, and uh, I, had, I have a chapter on sort of the history of the development of crime, the concept of crime um, and criminal laws in England uh, to illustrate that uh, people function quite well without criminal law because it was tort and, and they cooperate, co cooperate in pursuit and prosecution and all those sorts of things. So they uh, had a system without having crimes. Crimes are offenses against the state. Initially, they were things like treason and so on, but now it's uh, practically everything you can think of. Um, the uh, in, I think it was 2008, a, 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 someone at Heritage tried to just count the federal crimes. Um, and essentially it's impossible because they're, they're stuck all over the uh, federal law. But he came up with 45,000 federal crimes. And then another 300,000 uh, regulatory uh rules that had criminal uh, penalties attached to them. Um, so uh, crime uh, went from being a very small part of law to a huge part of law. And, and uh, I wanted to emphasize that. Um, and, and then uh, I guess uh, the last, uh, couple of chapters essentially asked what could, what would the private sector do if it could, if it wasn't prevented from um, moving into uh, these various uh, uh, stages of the criminal justice process. Um, and uh, arguing that essentially uh, the private sector has historically or is doing it all. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's limited in many cases by law that says uh, private security can't carry guns or private security can't arrest people or things like that. Uh, there's all sorts of rules that limit what the private sector can do. Uh, you take those limits off and I think you'd uh, uh, see, uh, well, it's estimated that there are about three times as many private security personnel as there are public police in the United States today. Um, so uh, there's a big chunk of uh, activity, uh, especially in crime prevention uh, that the public sector is, uh, is not dealing with effectively. And, and, uh, and so I, I looked at uh, private prisons, uh, alternatives to uh, punishment, like, uh, yeah, you know, prison work programs that could raise restitution. Um, all of the things I looked at uh, were, have at some point been dealt with by the private sector or they are today. And, and uh, so that was, uh, that book essentially was, uh, let's step back from the big picture, look at crime by itself. What could we do to um, fix it? <laughs> and uh, uh, privatize, uh, privatize, um, uh, it, I would say uh, today, I, I say we, we need to decriminalize, get rid of all, a lot of these crimes and turn them back into torts. Uh, and we need to privatize, uh, get rid of all the restrictions on the private sector, uh, at least make the public sector compete. Uh, and uh, I think uh, they'd lose uh, and we'd see a very different system. Um, and sometimes if you, if you ask people, what do you think would happen if private security forces ever came to outnumber 
government police and they usually think oh some terrible thing would happen they already do <laughs> it happened already a while ago <laughs> yeah yeah around uh, it, it was estimated around 1960 i think roughly equal number of private security and public police man uh public police have grown much slower than private security since then so it's uh um and private security of course i i do discuss private security and and the misconceptions about it as well it's not a bunch of uh old uh pot-bellied uh security guards uh, kind of strolling around the mall or something like that it's uh, it has them <laughs> but it has uh, well, old pot-bellied cops strolling around various places too <laughs> well usually driving around yeah they don't walk nearly as much as private security um but the uh, and so you have uh uh a whole range the thing about the uh, private sector the market is it uh encourages specialization so you get if you need just someone with eyes to call uh cops if if somebody uh is doing something wrong they're pretty cheap um but you they're not they're not supposed to do anything but but that uh on the other hand if you need a uh, you know someone uh, that can set up a security system for a corporation uh, and uh, including its buildings and its uh, its uh, internet activities and all that sort of stuff uh, you need somebody pretty competent and he's probably going to get paid uh, lots of money um, and so you get the whole range of uh, private security whereas police essentially all get the same training there's some specialization within police forces. Uh, you know, you have a homicide division and a burglary division and things like that, but not nearly as much and as the Right. Yeah. Which is yeah. mostly stuff that's no one's business. But. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's very, uh, I think what we have today is very different than what is widely perceived to be uh, exist but uh, uh, uh today i mean half well uh probably 10 to 20 percent of the ads on television are for various kinds of security cameras and things like that um, that uh, are giving private individuals the power to uh, protect themselves, or uh, at least to a degree, um, and uh, uh, so uh, it's not just private security personnel. Uh, the security market uh, has mushroomed um, in uh, terms of technology. Because the police get paid whether they protect you or not, yeah. uh, and you know, obviously, you would prefer. Uh, preventing the crime to chasing someone afterward. And if they are chasing someone afterward, you prefer that they catch them to them, that they not catch them. But, you know, they get their paycheck, whichever those things happened. Yeah. Uh, so they'll often do whichever is either easiest for them or most gratifying for them, which isn't always the same thing. Um, yeah, I, I, I think uh, public sector uh, policing uh, has perverted incentives. They've got things backwards. They, uh, you know, police budgets, historically, the negotiating points have been um, how many arrests you make and how quick your response is to a reported crime. Well, if the crime has already been committed, then as far as I'm concerned, uh, the process is, has failed. Uh, you want to prevent that crime from occurring, uh, and you do that by patrolling um, and... Uh, you know the public police sit in their cars and wait for a call to uh, respond to a, a crime uh the patrol i play places around here in auburn where they'll just they'll have a parked car a parked police car with no one in it just yeah. in the area. they think they might be crying they think that's going to 
it's kind of like they think that the criminals are like birds and they see a scarecrow and they, they yeah. don't notice that the car contains no police. It just yeah. they'll be scared of the car. Well, that uh, you know, maybe oh, maybe overstating the effectiveness of of that. Yeah, there's a, a there's a small town in Wyoming uh, where where the highway goes through it. Uh, and it's a straight line, uh, you know, so people are traveling probably 80, 90 miles an hour when they hit the uh, city limits. Um, and uh, down uh, just past uh, a couple of blocks down, there's a curve in the highway and they have a police car sitting there at that curve. And so people coming in they see that police car and presumably they slow down uh, of course the locals don't slow down or because the town doesn't have any police it just has a police car sitting uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah uh, I, it's probably a deterrent for uh, people traveling through until they yeah, well, I mean, if you're, if you're just driving by in a car, it's, um, you know, but of course, if you're driving by in a car, the um, the only, uh, you know, it's only, you know, traffic violations that are likely to be deterred, which I think that these cars are scattered around were not for traffic violations, but like to prevent other kinds of crime, mm -hmm. uh, at least in some cases, given the places where they were parked. And, um, um, it just struck me that that you know, so it was likely to be like trying to deter people on foot, and those people on foot are the ones who are most likely to notice that the car that the car contains no occupants. Uh, I want yeah. to talk a little bit about the um, the uh, American Indian book, which I have not read, uh, the one on uh, self determination. Can you say a little bit about that? I know you have, you have a chapter in that, and it's a bunch of other people as well. But can you say a little bit about what's going on now? Uh, um, Terry Anderson, uh, who co-edited it with me, it was uh, president of uh, PERC at that time, uh, and he got uh, he was contacted by uh, a, a foundation who wanted uh, a, a book with papers about alternatives to uh, Native American policy, both in Canada and the US. Um, and so uh, the, Tom Flanagan uh, is a uh, uh, political scientist at University of Calgary. Uh, so we had the three of us uh, edit, uh, invite and edit a series of papers. Uh, and the idea was to stress institutions uh, and property rights uh, as opposed to uh, you know what typical policy is uh, how do we start a new industry while well, we give them a bunch of money or how do we uh, uh, get uh, improve their uh, education we give them a bunch of money uh, the uh, what we uh, wanted to do then was look at institutions that appeared to work um, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, private, uh, uh, well, they're in the United States, uh, Indian reservations, uh, there's three kinds of property rights in land. Uh, the, the, Within the reservation border, there's private property uh, because it was allocated under the Dawes Act uh, up until 1933 when they ended uh, the allocation. Um, and there's uh, tribal trust land, which is essentially common property for the tribe. And then there's individual trust land, which is a uh, a weird sort of category because under the law, uh, 
the Indians had to hold the land for 25 years before uh, that was allocated to them before they actually got fee simple rights. Uh, so it was held in trust by the government. So in 1933, they say, we're going to end all this uh, privatizing the land. So we got uh, uh, tribal trust land, Bureau of Indian Affairs is the trustee. Uh, individual trust land, Bureau of Indian Affairs is a trustee, and we got private. Who do you trust more? <laughs> yeah, and uh, and so uh, Anderson uh, and a co-author took a look at the impact of, of these different, because there's a whole some some reservations are virtually entirely tribal trust land, and some are virtually entirely private property. Uh, there's a whole mix of of uh, uh, different property arrangements across reservations. So they did some empirical work to see uh, what re uh, what reservations appeared to be the most productive in terms of agricultural output. Um, and it's not going to surprise you that the reservations that had the most private property were the most productive. More product came off those reservations, controlling for as many things that affect production as possible, like weather and and so on, um, and uh, uh, that the trust lands were uh, much. I think I should. The tribal trust lands were maybe a little better than the, pri uh, the individual trust lands because. <laughs> this is another aspect of that law. Uh, the uh, law says that a holder of individual trust land can't designate uh, uh, an heir uh, if he passes away. Uh, the property has to go to uh, what uh, be divided up, however, the um, state law says so some states you know you, if if you don't have an heir it goes to your brothers or your cousins or your whoever uh, usually several different people get a chunk well you can't break up those individual trust lands so what it happens is that each individual gets an ownership right uh, uh, to uh, part of the land and and uh, so you get this fractured ownership with hundreds of people today uh, owning uh, 120 acres of land. How do you decide what you're going to do on that land? Uh, who cares? You, you're only if you even use it effectively, you're only going to get a few cents a piece uh, from uh, from production. And so uh, it, the the uh, this decision most of that land ends up being leased to non-Indians. Uh, the uh, So anyway, they looked at uh, the uh, benefit of private property. Um, now, there's different possibilities there. And we discuss, for instance, do you privatize completely so the owner can sell it to whoever he wants to? Um, that's the preferred solution in terms of economic productivity, um, or do you privatize, but it has to be sold to another Native American, or it has to be sold to uh, someone on the reservation or whatever, uh, you know, so there's all sorts of nuances to that question. Um, and then we looked at institutions like governance institutions, um, uh, there, there's uh, some pretty good governments out there on reservations. None of them, uh, none of them <laughs> break even. They, they're all uh, they all require subsidization, but some of them are relatively effective. Um, the uh, uh, and, and there's really a couple of different models of, of governance on the reservations. Once more a corporate model where you sort of have a CEO and a board of 
trustees and, and a relatively small uh, decision-making body, hierarchical uh, individual responsibility for various uh, things and so on. And they tend to be pretty good. Uh, the uh, Flathead Reservation Montana is, uh, is one of the better ones of those. Um, there's some uh, that essentially have a strong chief authoritarian leader. Uh, they can be good or bad, um, depending on the individual, I suppose. Um, and there's some that have set up various kinds of uh, democracies, <laughs> uh, like uh, the Crow Reservation. Um, everyone on the reservation is a member of the uh, sort of the board of trustees. So they vote on everything. Uh, and they, you know, they're forming coalitions and they're fighting, uh, they're trying to uh, get my family uh, some goodies from some federal grant and prevent some other family from doing it. And, and uh, it's, uh, it's a disaster. Um, and so we looked at governance institutions, um, what other kinds of institution? We looked uh, at uh, the casino movement um, and uh, Ron Johnson wrote a, a very interesting paper there. I think um, he sort of described casinos, the casino uh, wave as uh, the new Buffalo. Essentially, there's a common pool out there, all these people who wanna gamble and their money. And so you start opening up uh, reservations to put in casinos and they're all gonna rush in to get into that pot. But then you see uh, the states start seeing all that money going to the reservation and they're not getting their cut. And so the states start doing uh, lotteries, um, or start opening up uh, gambling in certain towns like uh, um, Deadwood, South Dakota. Um, and uh, so you get uh, or the riverboat gambling uh, in, in Missouri. You can't gamble on the land, but you can gamble on a boat. And so there's boats tied up to docks <laughs> where people go to gamble. Uh, Mississippi that way too. Um, so you get uh, all this entry into the gaming market um, and uh, the uh, Johnson says it's essentially going to be like the Buffalo Bowl. You're going to deplete the resource uh, and, uh, and of course you got reservations now. Some make huge amounts of money the Seminole and, and some up in uh, uh, Michigan and New York, uh, I think. But uh, the, uh, you've got lots of reservations in places like uh, Montana uh, and, and uh, where in Alaska, where there's no market for gaming, uh, essentially. And they all have spent money building casinos uh, and uh, the money, uh, you know, they're starting to close down casinos. It, it's been a, uh, a total uh, uh, disaster for some reservations. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, I, I personally, if they want to have gaming, that's fine. They should be able to have it. I don't have any objection to that. But the idea that it was going to be the savior for the uh, Indian reservations is simply um, not panning out. It, it, groups like the Seminole, who have made lots of money and then invested it in non-gaming activities, uh, buying uh, uh, Seminole owned the Hard Rock. Uh, hotels, for instance, or restaurants and stuff like that. Um, then uh, Those are the ones that are going to come through this looking good. Those who are spending the money as fast as it comes in uh, are probably 
uh, going to end up uh, not getting much out of it in the long run. Uh, so those are the kinds of things the book looks at. I, uh, my own contribution was essentially, uh, we had a couple of introductory chapters um, trying to dispel the myth that Indians don't believe in private property. Um, and uh, just explaining, you know, that uh, where, where Indians engaged in agriculture, they had private use rights to land, where they were hunting buffalo, where buffalo migrate over huge areas. They don't have private individualized land. It doesn't make sense. It wouldn't be worthwhile to even try. Uh, so uh, the uh, uh, issue then is what's the cost of privatizing the land relative to the benefits? Uh, and Indians recognized that quite uh, well back in uh, the pre-reservation day. Uh, they privatized land where it was appropriate. Uh, and didn't where it wasn't. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it, it uh, I, the other thing I should say is we had uh, half the authors were from Canada and half from the U.S. So we get some discussion of, of both Canadian and U.S. Uh, policy and alternatives. Uh, uh, Bruce Johnson from George Mason uh, did some stuff on uh, privatizing the uh, salmon rivers on uh, the west coast of Canada. Um, and uh, some of that's actually being done. They're turning those rivers over to the tribes. Um, so, uh, you know, it was essentially saying, let's look beyond just giving them money. Let's look at uh, institutions that we've saddled them with, change them if we can. Let's look at uh, property rights arrangements, uh, try to alleviate those problems and so on. One feature of reservation economic life reminds me a bit of the situation of Jews in the Middle Ages, so that most professions were barred to Jews. But on the other hand, they were the only ones who were allowed to lend at interest. So mm -hmm. if you allow them to go into something that that most people aren't allowed to go to but you forbid them from going into most other things suddenly you get this large you know, percentage of of jews involved in money lending and you get a whole yeah. bunch of people upset you know what you know what is it about jews and something inherent about jews that they've got this yeah. money lending thing nowadays we've got the situation where um with all these restrictions on what people could do on reservation land but they are exempt from a lot of uh, laws yeah. like high interest lending so now you've got this explosion of of high interest lending that's all uh, located on uh, Indian land. And, uh, you know, it's the same, you know, same thing as before. And mm -hmm. uh, before, of course, this led to a, um, you know, of course, there was already prejudice against Jews for various, uh, mostly religious reasons, but um, this led to further prejudice against Jews for a situation that had largely been created by <laughs> the people who were saying you can do this you can't do that and so they do this and not that and then you mm -hmm. know that so i you know i'm, I'm sure that they're, they're building prejudices against against uh american indians now for a lot of these uh high interest loans that uh people have difficulty uh repaying but of course you know if you feel you know, if they if they uh aren't you know there is not much competition for the you know for them in that area and then there's lots of other things that they're not allowed to do with their land lo and yeah. behold they move into that area big surprise they respond to incentives yeah uh yeah i i think that's an interesting example too uh, it uh and a lot of that uh money that's being loaned out of course is is not uh Indian money. It's not money from the tribe uh, or private uh, individual Native Americans. It's money coming from uh, big uh, banks and stuff like that, I, uh, I would guess. Um, a lot of the uh, same with the casinos. Uh, uh, a lot of the big uh, casino 
gambling establishments have uh, joined with the tribe to build the casino on the reservation and and get a, a, a substantial, oftentimes manage the casino as well uh, and uh, take a big cut, of course, uh, from the revenues that are coming in. Uh, so uh, even, uh, even those examples like that uh, where um, it looks like the Indians are have an advantage. Uh, it, well, one problem again is property rights. Uh, Indians with tribal trust and individual trust lands, those lands can't be sold. Uh, so you can't use them for collateral. Uh, I mean, they can't be transferred. So a bank gives you a loan uh, and you put up your land as collateral. If you don't pay, they can come and get the land. Uh, but not uh, not on the reservations typically, uh, except for the private property on the reservations. Um, and so uh, for years and well, since reservations started forming, there's been a tremendous uh, capital shortage on reservations. They can't get loans. Uh, and then uh, so they have to invite outsiders to come in and provide uh, provide the capital and and let them uh, then uh, capture at least some uh, of the revenues from it. Um, and uh, so that's also been a, uh, an issue. Uh, and then the courts have screwed things up some too. Uh, for instance, uh, the, uh, uh, it was one of the Apache reservations uh, I can't remember which one, but they had a contract uh, with a uh, an oil gas exploration company uh, to come in and, and explore for oil and gas. Uh, and part of the deal was, if you find it, you you uh, pay a royalty and, and you then it goes to you to sell. Um, and so what happened, uh, and, and so this is a contract. This is the, the cut that you have to give to the tribe. Uh, well, after they found oil and start shipping it out, the tribe says, well, we're gonna impose an excise tax on top of that. Uh, so the tribe has uh, uh, used its governance uh, authority to essentially break the contract by adding charges uh, that weren't anticipated. I am altering the deal. Pray I don't alter it any further. Um, and, and as a consequence, it's hard for tribes everywhere now to get people off reservation to come on to the reservations and make investments like that. Um, so uh, by making pretending that the tribes are uh, sovereign nations <laughs> uh, and giving some of the authority of sovereign nations to them, uh, they have uh, created this kind of distrust, both, I mean, the Indians don't trust the non-Indians and vice versa uh, because of the incentives that have been created in uh, by the government, essentially, in setting them up. Uh, With your like 200 plus articles, you've obviously got a lot of material that hasn't made it into your books. Have you thought about collecting any of those articles into, into books where they'd be sort of more accessible? Uh, not really. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm working... I guess what I did in the past uh, was uh, to, as I was working on books, um, I pulled articles from the material so that I had a steady stream of articles going out um, uh, that were complementary, at least to the book that I was working on. Um, and uh, so, a lot of the material, for instance, in 
the enterprise of law and to serve and protect um, has been published as articles. Uh, the, uh, uh, the idea of compiling more papers into articles, uh, uh, it's, it's more work than it's worth, I guess, to me, now that I'm retired. <laughs> uh, I am working on a book on the enterprise, on, on, the, uh, on the medieval law merchant. And yeah, that I it, say, I've been hearing rumors for a while about a, a law merchant yeah. project. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, various criticisms of, of yeah. people said about the law merchant. Yeah, I, and I've been working on that off and on for quite a while. Uh, much of it uh, will consist of papers, essentially of papers that have been published in journals, uh, sort of bringing all that stuff together. But it's not a compilation of, of published papers. It's uh, it, it's an attempt to provide a, a relatively detailed uh, description, both theoretically and empirically, of the law merchant. Uh, and um, I don't know, uh, it was, it started out also to include uh, uh, an attempt to refute various criticisms of the law merchant that have popped up in the last 20 years or so. Um, yeah, I've heard the title is Yes, Virginia, There Was a Law Merchant or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> that, that was the title. That, that was the, that's the working title. Yeah, I don't... Uh, I don't know if that's a good title because uh, uh, pro probably the Europeans won't know uh, about that uh, movie anyway. <laughs> you could always make it a chapter title. Yeah. Uh, can you say a little bit about what the criticisms were and what your response to them is? Um, well, of course, the uh, there there are people, historians, legal scholars who don't believe anything unless it's been written down. And uh, so if you're going to look at the medieval law merchant, a lot of the stuff was never recorded. Uh, the disputes, you find a few disputes uh, that have were recorded, but compared to the mass of disputes that were probably dealt with, not very many. Uh, there's no uh, real compilation of uh, rules. There's partial compilations uh, like uh, maritime rules compiled by uh, the, uh, uh, well, the first, well, the first one was from Rhodes, uh, way before the medieval period. But um, uh, there's an island off the coast of France uh, that was heavily involved in the wine trade, and they a, a compilation of customs uh, dealing with uh, maritime wine trade was put together by them. Uh, Barcelona had a compilation. Uh, there was one up in, uh, in uh, the Baltic and so on. Uh, so there is some written record uh, of things. Uh, but, uh, and, and there are uh, depositories uh, of records that have been used to try to get an, uh, an idea about the law merchant uh, or if they don't want to call it that about commercial uh, law. And um, so they, uh, uh, but there's big gaps. Uh, and uh, I <clears throat> and others uh, over the, over, <clears throat> over history have, fill those gaps essentially theoretically. Yeah. Um, you got this set of rules and institutions in one period, 
And sometime later, you see this other set. They're not the same. Uh, there's a lot of similarities. You sort of uh, hypothesize about uh, how they might have changed and why they might have changed to get to the new set, uh, that sort of thing. Um, I, I think uh, if you're going to look at history, you have to use some theory <laughs> because um, the, the historical record is incomplete. And if you just say that doesn't exist because there's no record of it or there's no detailed record of it, um, you're throwing a lot, a lot of insights away, I think. Um, yeah, I and mean, Colin but, said he was one of the major philosophers of history. He said there was a big advance when people realized history was not just what he called scissors and paste history, where you, you just collect what various previous people have said and you arrange it and you pick whichever things are most plausible. But then they uh, came and they advanced past that and came to think that, came to understand that it's more like being a detective solving a, uh, solving a case and documents are one piece of evidence. Yeah. Although they're, you know, you don't just accept the document as an authority. You don't accept anything as an authority. Yeah. Just, but the documents are evidence. I remember David Friedman talking about how the the um, the contrast he found between you know Icelandic law is written down in the you know in the Gragas uh, law code versus the description of how it worked in the sagas, and he's inclined to think that the latter is is actually more accurate. Uh, yeah. anyway, Collingwood said, you know, you've got to get past thinking of documents as your authorities, and therefore where there's no document, there's nothing for the historian to do except shrug their shoulders, versus thinking of a historian as a detective, where when you've got documents, that's an important piece of evidence, when you don't have documents, you've got other kinds of evidence, uh, and you come up with the best you know, explanatory theory that makes sense of what these people were doing and and why they were uh, yeah. doing it. Uh, but yeah, I think you know, some historians have, may still be you know, a little too attached to the scissors and paste theory that you've got you to find your documents and then they are the authorities that will tell you what happened. Uh, yeah, I, another uh, critical, uh, uh, a crit it's pretty strong criticism, I would say, is that uh, many people, including me to a degree, uh, focused on the universal nature of the law merchant. Um, rather than recognizing that it really is a polycentric system uh, with lots of overlapping uh, influences and so on, uh, it's universal in the sense that it was everywhere in Europe. Uh, it wasn't identical everywhere. Um, and uh, so uh, those like Harold Berman uh, emphasized universal characteristics um, in part, of course, because Berman's book was a, uh, a sort of a, yeah, uh, he was looking at different legal systems, uh, how they interacted with one another. Uh, and how they might uh, be characterized. And one of his criteria that he used was uh, universalism. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he, he didn't say the law merchant was universal. It had some universal characteristics. It was tending toward universal uh, uh, ism and so on. So, uh, so uh, some of it's uh, that, uh, another course source of criticism. Uh, is just the uh, the statists who say there can't be private law. Uh, you're not, uh, uh, and then they go looking for. Is that an empirical uh, claim or a, or a uh, definitional claim? Is that an empirical claim or a definitional claim? Well, uh, yeah, it's a definitional claim that they try to support um, by finding um, indications of how the state uh, might have interacted with merchants and law merchants and so on. Uh, the, uh, and so you can always find, I mean, every legal system is influenced by other legal systems. There, uh, uh, there's more influence going from the law merchant to, to state law, I think, than vice versa. 
but that doesn't mean uh, there were no influences uh, from the state law uh, on, in the law merchant. Um, I mean, law merchant didn't have a king. They didn't have an authority, an army or something like that to prevent other uh, institutions want, from interfering with their activities. Uh, so if the state, if the king said, you got to do this, um, and you wanted to trade in his kingdom, then you probably had to do it. Uh, it was a law that affected merchants. Uh, but, uh, and, and that's one criticism is, you know, merchants had lots of laws that affected them, not, uh, and, and so to say the law merchant ruled the, mer uh, the commercial process is wrong. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, uh, fail, I think, to uh, on a couple of points uh, to when they're making that argument. One is that merchant wealth was mobile, much more so than wealth based on land. And, and that was the two kinds of wealth really in the medieval period. Um, and so if the local law gets too uh, harmful for the merchants, they move. Uh, they start trading someplace else. Um, and, and so <clears throat> you can look at- The court of the dust of feet. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, so that, uh, and then uh, uh, the other, I mean, the other point is, okay, you, you find say, a local government or a, um, perhaps a, even a kingdom, I, uh, I can't think of any, uh, but that where they had recorded a bunch of uh, merchant custom in, as part of their local uh, law. And so they can say, well, the merchants might've had these rules, but they had to have the local government enforce them. See, I mean, why would they write them down if they weren't? Um, if that wasn't the case. Um, and uh, so uh, they make those sorts of arguments. Um, I'm not convinced by them, obviously, but uh, uh, I've been in the process of, of uh, trying to find counter evidence. Uh, if uh, it turns out to be pretty easy to refute most of the arguments because they simply are superficial, uh, don't go really into the uh, historical record the way they should and so on. Um, but uh, um, I, in fact, when this stuff started, these criticisms started coming out, I read a couple of them, thought this is ridiculous. And this guy's making stuff up. Uh, he's not using uh, the evidence that's out there, uh, or he's misinterpreting it. He doesn't understand the historical situation uh, that existed at the time. He sort of thinks commerce was like it is today, you know, things like that. And I just pretty much ignored it. Uh, I didn't think there was any need to refute it. Uh, but then uh, after a few years, uh, I started getting qu questions, even from friends uh, who bought the law merchant story, uh, asking what I think about these various criticisms. Uh, and, uh, you know, if it's, if it's uh, making them think about the criticisms, then those who are uh, anxious to uh, disprove uh, or reject the law merchant story, um, they, they're going to buy into those things uh, very easily. Um, and so I thought I started thinking about refuting uh, at least some of the more powerful ones, or uh, apparently more powerful, uh, written by prestigious law professors or published in prestigious law re reviews and that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, but it, <clears throat> at this point, I think I've, I've decided that I'm going to 
separate the project into two parts. I'm going to do a book describing the medieval law merchant, not directly addressing the criticisms indirectly by presenting my interpretation at least, uh, but not directly. And then I'm going to write a, a separate manuscript, which probably will be a law review article or something that takes on the critics um, and, uh, directly and, and doesn't have to make the, try to do both of those, as it turns out, pretty large projects in one volume. So that's the point I'm at now is trying to divide this stuff up into uh, re reasonable packages uh, that uh, I can go forward with. I look forward I, and most of the material I've got. Um, they, uh, the Mercatus uh, Center uh, sponsored a uh, manuscript conference uh, where I sent the manuscript to them and they sent it out uh, to 15 or 16 economists and law professors. And uh, we sat around a table and they commented on the book. Uh, and certainly one comment, as most of what I write, uh, it's too long. <laughs> Uh, that would it, never be uh, nice. uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, they uh, also uh, thought uh, that there were really uh, two two separate, at least two. Uh, some people said three uh, books. In that, uh, I don't know if I want to write three books at this at my current age, but. Uh, I think I've convinced myself that I'll do uh, at least one book and a uh, law review article uh, or monograph of some sort uh, uh, to uh, deal with the law merchant. Um, and I, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure why I'm doing this because I don't, you know, I'm not an academic anymore. I don't get uh, uh, raises based on publications and that sort of thing, but it's just a, a, a project that uh, I've been involved with for several decades now, and I uh, just kind of would like to top it off and uh, have, it probably won't be the final word, but uh, a, a take a shot at the final word on, on the subject. I think I'd heard a rumor about that conference because I was at a I was in a Mercatus conference that was organized by Nira Badwar on abolition, abolitionism and emancipation that was either just before or just after your conference, I think, um, which I've been hearing mm. uh, about it. Um, but it was, I was curious. And, you know, and now I'd read some of the criticisms. I'd read some of your responses. So, you know, I, I knew a little bit about that. But yeah, uh, I have. A yeah, I have published a couple of things that respond. Uh, to some of the criticisms, but, uh, and one of the criticisms, of course, is, is just definitional. What do we mean by law? Uh, if it, if the law has to be the product of the state, then the law merchant wasn't law. Uh, to well, me, I'm, that's not a big I'm issue. Teaching, I'm teaching philosophy of law right now. And uh, so obviously that's a deal topic we're dealing with, but uh, you know, people like Hayek and, and Fuller and so forth, got lots of people arguing that the, you know, that law has not traditionally meant solely or even primarily yeah. uh, uh, state. and and obviously if you've you've read my stuff i uh, hayek and fuller uh, both have had big influences on the way i think about law uh, in fact it was interesting uh, when the enterprise of law was being reviewed uh, uh, one i went to texas a m which was sort of a uh, southern branch of Chicago uh, at that time, very neoclassical kind of program. Uh, one of the reviewers uh, of uh, the enterprise of law was Randy Barnett, who's uh, a lawyer. Um, and he, he wrote a very, I mean, he wrote almost a book 
at length review of it. he was taken by the ideas and so on and and one and thing he that. said was uh, <laughs> one thing he said was this sounds very hayek but you're not citing hayek and my response was i haven't read hayek I didn't read Hayek in graduate school. Nobody ever talked about Hayek in graduate school. It was all, uh, you know, Friedman and Stiegler and and Becker and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, then I started reading Hayek, and and it, it uh, really was eye opening. I, I mean, uh, had a huge impact on the way I think about things. Um, and uh, you know. I'll be forever grateful to Randy for bringing that up. Um, although I probably would have stumbled yeah. on. Well, given the circles you were you yeah. were moving in, you would have you know it would have come your way eventually. Yeah. Well, I yeah I hadn't really moved into those circles as I was writing the Enterprise of Law. I mean, I was mm -hmm. maybe on the fringe. A uh, few people had heard of me and uh, knew me, but uh, for the most part. Uh, it was the enterprise of law that sort of opened the doors for me. And, and uh, at that point, I certainly would have uh, heard about Hayek, I'm sure, uh, or stumbled into Hayek, but uh, it, um, Randy's suggestion uh, made me do it before I actually published the enterprise of law. And it had big impact on some of the things that are in that book, even though probably don't cite him enough <laughs> still. Um, the, uh, I just always found it, uh, odd that, uh, uh, not odd, uh, disturbing that I would come up with some idea that seemed worth exploring and I'd start writing about it and, uh, thinking about it, fleshing the idea out. Uh, and then I'd go out and look at literature to see if anybody else had been thinking along those lines. And I, and I inevitably stumble onto something by James Buchanan or uh, somebody like that, who'd already written this, the same thing, essentially. <laughs> uh, seems like we reinvent the wheel in, in economics about every 20 years. I mean, it, it, we say the same things as we were saying 20 years ago but we say them differently uh mathematics was a big uh, a big imp had a big impact game theory had a big impact saying the same stuff but just uh, using different language um, and uh you know we don't read enough uh, so we uh, think of an idea we think is original uh, and don't discover that it's not. <laughs> well, that's a complaint I've heard from a lot of economists, a lot of, well, our type of people, is that economists don't really engage that much with the history of their own discipline. Uh, of course, over in philosophy, yeah. it's very different. Uh, you know, the history of philosophy is very much part of the study of philosophy, but the history of, econo of yeah. economic thought is, um, is uh, less so, and the, the people who tend to be really interested in um, in what previous you know economists uh, fifty years ago or hundred years ago or two hundred years ago are saying, um, you know, they tend to be you know, free market classical liberal uh, types who are interested in sort of this tradition. Um, yeah. Uh, whereas uh, you know, for a lot of like a lot of economists, I think they have this idea that the you know, the model to imitate is like physics and physics, you know. You know, you don't pay attention to what you know Ptolemy said about physics. That's all outdated. Yeah. We know all the all the good stuff is yeah. is uh, you know is new, and um, and they've got these fancy mathematical techniques to deal with this new information, and and so maybe part of sort of the the physics work worship on a part of a lot of a lot of the social sciences. Uh, whereas I, I think the mainstream in economics by and large uh considers history of thought to be irrelevant uh it's the sort of fringes the austrians uh, uh, and the marxists yeah. one thing the austrians and marxists, the marxists. Have, um, 
is that they they're yeah. worse than what 19th century people were saying. <laughs> uh, yeah, that uh, that's what I was going to say. The Austrians and the Marxists. Um, in fact, uh, yeah, <laughs> little anecdote there. I uh, when I was at Florida State, we uh, interviewed a guy and an avowed Marxist. Uh, you know, nice guy. I enjoyed talking to him and so on. But uh, uh, we interviewed him, uh, and uh, after the interview, uh, I don't know. My department chair said something to him about, uh, uh, "Did you find any of the faculty to be uh, sort of?" uh thinking about the same things you are and and uh uh people you could interact with and so on because we didn't have any marxists on the faculty he said oh i've really uh, enjoyed talking to those austrians he said uh and the public choice uh, austrians uh, because um you know it's uh, all about uh influence on the government uh, by powerful groups like corporations and that sort of thing. Uh, the uh, I mean, one difference, of course, is that uh, public choice uh, Austrians, they think about lots of different groups being influential. Uh, Marxists just think about capitalists and, and labor and conflict, uh, it seems like. And so uh, it, brought, it broadened his view a little bit um uh, but uh and, and you know in, in a lot of ways that sort of analysis is complementary across the two disciplines or sub disciplines um, conclusions are very different but <laughs> yeah i mean the um i mean marx is sort of uh you know bifurcated on this and that um uh you know on the one hand when he talks about how these um you know how the um, the ruling capitalist class acquired their wealth. They'll talk about all these violent interventions by the state on behalf of wealthy private interests. But then he seems to forget about it and talk as though it all arose through, you know, all this malign power arose through, through simple pure free markets. And yeah. sometimes his, sort of his official line is, well, in fact, it didn't arise through free markets. It arose through government violence. But if we had free markets, it would have arisen eventually um the same way and then eventually that just sort of gives way to um later marxists just treating it as though uh it had yeah. just arisen um through free markets and you know whereas when marx is talking about sort of actual details of history as opposed to his abstract theory you know the distance between him and classical liberalism is much less so he's talking about for example the yeah. uh, you know yeah. the the French, I think that's uh, true. The French government yeah. as a uh, as a joint stock company for the uh, exploitation of uh, France's national wealth and uh, and so mm -hmm. on, uh, you know. And uh, and when he freely admitted that a lot of his class theory he borrowed from um, uh, from uh, the bourgeois economists. Uh, although he says, "Well, I added mm -hmm. the idea that that the um, that the class uh, the conflict of classes could eventually." Uh, could eventually end. No, you didn't, Marx. They, they, they had that idea too. Uh, you read uh, Charles Dunoyer and Charles Comte and Augustin Thierry and uh, and those guys. They also foresaw a, a classless, in some cases, even stateless society, though not a society free of private property. Uh, that was one important difference, but uh, you know, Marx sometimes exaggerated his originality. Anyway, we should probably wrap this up because this is about as long a video as, you know, with my system, it takes forever to upload these to upload these videos to YouTube, and this is a, probably about as long as uh, as it can handle without uh, 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 have, uh, having my system completely occupied with with uploading for over a day. Um, uh, uh, uh yeah well this is not high tech land where i am uh, and this is not where i am um, anyway 
Yeah, I was wondering uh, what that background was. That is, that's actually uh, Athens. This is the uh, Acropolis oh, okay. photo in Athens. And so I, I can pretend to hear where it's you. I'll show yeah, you where I really am. Uh, where I really am is, um, uh, let's see, how do I make the second? Yeah, I was uh, thinking you were sitting on a balcony someplace in uh, Europe and, and probably in the Mediterranean. And <laughs> yeah, well, this is the sordid reality of my my cramped Alabama apartment. Uh, so I prefer uh, prefer returning to the fantasy. <laughs> but anyway, thank you. Well, uh, fun. Thank you for the interview. Uh, thank you. Uh, I enjoyed it. And uh, yeah. You had a really nice good to talk for not uh, you know, for you know, originally this interview was going to be the 50th anniversary uh, of my 50th anniversary, <laughs> one year anniversary, one fifty whatever. This was going to be the interview for my one year anniversary of my YouTube channel. But you had a really good excuse for postponing. You really went to a desperate lengths to uh, uh, to skip our original uh, interview. Uh, <laughs> Um, but anyway, well, uh, yes. I, I tend to avoid most of these kinds of things anymore. Uh, but uh, I figured this would be interesting, and it was. And uh, so, appreciate you thinking of me. I, it, I, it is good to talk to an academic once in a while, to uh, rather than my grandkids and and that sort of thing. But. Uh, uh, so, Greg, thank you for having me. You questions about the wall merchant? Mm, what's that? Your grandkids aren't pestering you with questions about the wall merchant? Not yet, no. Uh, I, my grandson has lots of questions about how, uh, chess. We play chess together, but that's about the most uh, intellectual thing we, we end up talking about. Well, it ends with the defeat of a king, so that's good. <laughs> well, All right. well, well I, the ideal chess game would end with the defeat of both kings, but uh, that's another question matter. All right, anyway, so thanks a lot. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks for uh, taking time uh, to uh, to talk to me. Um, and uh, you know, good luck with your various projects, the um, the Plains Indian Project and the Law Merchant Project and anything else you're working on. And, uh, Anyway, huh? good to talk same to you. to you. I'm sure you got a lot of, a lot of things you're working on too. Oh yeah, I'm way behind uh, on so many deadlines. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's uh, that's my problem with the law merchant. I've been working on it so long that uh, it's hard to even sit down and write it down because I it's I don't I already know it. I don't need to study it. <laughs> Uh, but it's coming together. Good. I look forward to it. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. All right.